Good evening. Welcome everyone out tonight. Uh, good to see everybody here. Church looks good. Uh, it has been quite the day. Amen. <laughs> uh, we've had all kinds of excitement and uh, great things happening and we're, we're excited about that and we're going to start off the service tonight with uh, equal excitement. All right. Um, this has been a long time coming but it is, uh, I am just about beside myself tonight but uh I'd like this, uh, John and Lily, if they would come up front, and Amanda, and Miguel, and Javi, and Brother Kevin, and Jesse and Ross. <clears throat> they would they would like to join our church. I think I speak for all of the church. Um, they've they've all been such a blessing to us, and uh, and we we do appreciate all of them. And I could spend a long time talking about each individual, but uh, from the bottom of my heart, I do love everybody standing before us, and and what a blessing to have them join our church and desire to join our join our church. So um, let's read the church covenant. This is a very good covenant. Um, it, it just really gives a really the goal of all of our lives, what, what it should be. So we'll read that uh, to, to all of them. <clears throat> Having given ourselves to God by faith in Jesus Christ and adopted the word of God as the rule and faith and practice, we now give ourselves to one another by the will of God in this solemn covenant. We promise by his grace to love and obey him in all things, to avoid all appearance of evil and abstain from sinful amusements and unholy conformities to the world from all the sanction and use and sell of intoxicating beverages and to provide things honest in the sight of all men. We agree faithfully to, to discharge our obligations in reference to the study of scriptures, secret prayer, family devotion, social worship, by self-denial, faith, and good works, endeavor to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We will not forsake the assembling of ourselves together for the church conferences, public worship, the observance of the ordinances of the gospel, nor fa fail to pay according to our ability for the support of the church and, and its poor and its benevolent works. We agree to accept Christian admonition and reproof with meekness and to watch over one another in love endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bonds of peace to be careful of one another's happiness and reputation and seek to strengthen the weak encourage the afflicted admonish the erring and as far as we are able promise the promote the success of the church and the gospel we will everywhere hold Christian principles sacred and Christian obligations and enterprises supreme, counting it our chief business in life to extend the influence of Christ in society 
constantly praying and toiling that the kingdom may come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. To this end, we agree to labor for the promotion of the educational and denominational enterprises to support missions for the success of Sunday schools and evangelical efforts for the salvation of the world. And may the God of peace sanctify us wholly and preserve us blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's a pretty good covenant. <clears throat> so again, we are thrilled to have, uh, have these desire to join us. And, uh, um, boy, it's hard to do it without even crying. Amen. It's just, it's such, such a joy, such a blessing. And, and we're just thankful for it beyond measure. I, I think it would be, uh, the, I don't think we've ever done this before, uh, multiple families, but I think it would be in order if we, if we would take motions of a family at a time. I just think that would probably be a little bit more in order. So, um, so I present them to the church, and let's just let's just start over here to the left and just work our way through. So let's let's take Jesse and Ross, and uh, um, what's the pleasure of the church? Hey, but Charles, I think had the the first one, and, and Tom will second it. So motion's been made, second. All in favor, uplift the right hand. Opposed, same sign. All right, uh, John and John and Lily. <clears throat> What's all right? Brother Charles got the motion. A second. Joshua second that. All in favor, uplift the right hand. Post same sign. All right. Uh, um, Amanda and Miguel. All right, brother Richard. A second. Jacob. All right. Uh, all, all in favor, uplift the right hand. Post same sign. All right. <laughs> and. Last but not least, Brother Kevin. <laughs> all right, Brother Charles. Brother Richard, all right. They're jumping up all over the place. Uh, all, all in favor, uplift the right hand. Oppose, same sign. All right. So, Brother Darren will come to the piano. So here, here's what we like to do. I like to have everyone come up and welcome them in the church, have fellowship with them, and then uh, we're, we're going to pray over them and uh, and just they're just part of us now amen so what an exciting day let's let's have fellowship yeah let's let's start over here with jesse and ross work this way that way we're not running two different directions <laughs> there is a name i love to hear and i love to sing it's words it sounds like music in my ear the sweetest name on earth and oh how i love jesus oh how i love jesus oh how i love jesus because he first loved me it tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. And oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. It tells me what my Father hath in store for every day. And though I tread a darksome path, yield sunshine all of the way and oh how i love jesus oh how i love jesus oh how i love jesus because he first loved me it tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below and oh how i 
love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of His precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. And oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. He tells me what my Father hath in store for every day. And though I tread a darksome path, yield sunshine all of the way. And oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe. Who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. And oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. And oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. You guys all stay up here. <clears throat> let's have all of the let's have all the new members just stand here in the middle and those of you that are able let's just come up and have prayer over them and uh that the lord will bless them to uh, be used uh, by his mighty hand that the guy will keep them uh for many years in his service and <clears throat>
from the battle you're fighting does it seem like the storm just won't break is there a mountain in front of you the doubt says we'll never move and you wonder will god make a way been faithful and tell me a morning his mercies were new tell me a moment that he wasn't able to carry you through and tell me a day he was less than almighty If you doubt him, just read through his word and tell me a time that he's not been faithful and tell me.
sing the praises of the glory of Jehovah. And Paul preached that all is lost, if not in Christ. And little John said he is precious, while leaning on his bosom, so for a Lately I've been looking back along this winding road to an old familiar marker of the mercies I have known. I know it may sound simple, but it's more than a cliche. For there's no better way to tell you than to say. My God's been good <laughs> in my life. I feel so blessed beyond my wildest dreams as I go to sleep each night. And even though I've had some hard times, by my side he's always stood. And through it all, my God's been good. For times we're playing, I can see 
that I've cried some bitter tears. But I filled his arms around me as I faced my greatest fears. I've had more gains than losses, and I've known more joy than hurt. As his grace rolls down upon me, so undeserved, my God's been good. My life, I feel so blessed beyond my wildest dreams as I go to sleep each night. And even though I've had some hard times, by my side he's always stood. And through it all, God's been good. For God has been my father. He's been my savior. He's my friend. His love was my beginning. And his love will be my end. And I could spend forever trying to tell you everything that he is church the best way that i could say it is this my god's been good in my life oh i feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams as I go to sleep each night and even though I've had some hard times by my side he's always stood and through it all my God's been good although I've had my share of hard times by my side he's always stood and through it all my God's been good. I'm going to sing that song. And if you truly believe those words with all your heart, would you stand and rejoice in the name of the Lord tonight? For my God's been good. Has he been good to your church? In my life, I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams as I go to sleep each night. And even though I've had some hard times, by my side he's always stood. And through it all, my God's been good. Amen. God's been good to us. Amen. Uh, I'm, I'm just uh, beside myself how good God's been. Uh, I thank you just seems like so little. I, I said, Lord, I, I don't know what else to do but say thank you. But I, 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 that's all I got. It seems like not very much, but Lord, thank you. And God's been good to us. Amen. And uh, he's a good God. Um you know, it is mind blowing to me that um, it is joy to God to be good to us. You ever thought about that? <laughs> he enjoys being good to us. I don't know how that works out, but it just blows my mind <laughs> that he is. We're down here over bubbling over and how good he is to us. And he says, I'm enjoying being good to you. Yeah. Amen. Uh, he's a great God. Uh, <clears throat> so we have a new member that's going to preach for us tonight. All right. Uh, I, I'm sure he's going to preach a lot better now that he's a member. So, <laughs> uh, 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 Brother Miguel is very, very dear to me. And um, I, I have literally spent hours and hours and hours talking to him. And he'll never know how he has blessed my life. He just, I just can't even put into words what he, what he, how he has blessed my life. And he, we've shared our struggles. We've shared our victories. We've shared our, 
our questions. Um, but he, he has been a, a, such a blessing and his whole family, Amanda and, and, and his whole entire family, just such a blessing. We're, we're just so thankful to have them here and, uh, well, he's going to come preach for us. Amen. Let's give him our attention and get behind him and make it easy for him to preach and, and trust God will use him. Amen, church. I don't have words, church. I don't have words. I'm just so uh, overwhelmed. Uh, and uh, it started before today. I've been overwhelmed this whole week uh, just of how good God is. And yeah, amen. Um, just in my prayers, all I can say is just thank you, Lord. Yeah. I'm grateful that God has given me eyes to see just a glimpse of how great our God is. Amen. Yeah. That the God that we serve is not just the God that we read about in pages, but he's a God that he still is active today, church. He's a God that still saves today. And I'm so grateful uh, that he didn't give up on me. Yeah. That he continued to seek me. Yeah. And church is still available to each and every one of us, to each of our loved ones, our loved lost ones. That's the God that we serve. Amen. Praise God just for how good he is. Uh, open up your Bibles to the book of Luke. We're going to continue in our series of studying the, the book of Luke. And I'm just so grateful for um, just to be able to go through this book and just, just dive into his riches. Um, I encourage you, church, as the, the, the writer said, he did not just take the things that were given to him. He searched them out, church. He searched the rich, riches of God's word. And, and I encourage you to do that. Just because a, a, a preacher or a pastor or, or, or someone with eloquent talk can stand up behind a pulpit and say some eloquent words, don't just take them at their word. Search God's riches. Search him with all your heart. Amen? I am just, uh, again, I, I just don't have the words to say. So um, we're going to be reading, for, as I mentioned, uh, Luke chapter 4. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 13. If you will please just stand in honor of God's word. Um, say amen when you're there. Luke chapter 4, 4, verse 1. And the word of God says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness being 40 days tempted of the devil and in those days he did eat nothing and when they were ended he afterward hungered verse 3 and the devil said unto him if thou be the son of God command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but, but, but by every word of God. Verse 5, And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed him unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee in the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written that thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Verse 9, And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a high pentacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from here, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt 
the Lord thy God. Verse 13, church. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you just with grateful hearts, Lord, just to be able to be sit under your word once again. We thank you, Lord, for the service, Lord. We are beyond words, Father, but we thank you for the time of worship. We thank you that we are able to come freely, Lord, uh, without the fear of being persecuted or that the doors will be knocked down and they will take us away. Lord, forgive us, Father, for when we take these blessings for granted, Father, for when we come here, Lord, with close hearts. At this time now, Lord, I would like to pray for my people, your people, that you would open up their hearts to receive your word. Father, I think it's very obvious, Lord, that I'm no one. I don't have words. I don't know what they're going through. I get overwhelmed, Lord, just in praying for them. But you don't, Lord. Father, you see all things. You know what they're going through. You know the trials and the tribulations that they're dealing with right now, Father. And Lord, you had already promised us the victory. Father, if there's anyone here, Father, who's not confident, Lord, in the words that you have promised, that you would give us eternal life. Father, I pray that you would speak to them even now. Father, draw them closer to you, Lord. Father, show them the power of your gospel. Soften up their hearts, Lord, we pray. I thank you, Lord, for this time. May every word that I say, Lord, line up with your scripture. I thank you and I praise you and ask all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, Amen church. You may be seated. As uh, the title of uh, the message, uh, as you can see, the title of today's message is Temptation in the Wilderness. Now, um, I started this uh, passage back in October, and um, uh, I, I preached the first part where we took a look at temptation itself, and, and we kind of um, saw what temptation was uh, according to the Bible, and um, then we... Uh, Later on, I preached a message on sin, right, and the dangers of giving into temptation. Um, and and now, um, a couple of months later, I'm here preaching um, the last part of this of this uh, little mini series here. Um, I was speaking with the pastor today, uh, just of how long it has taken me to complete this small series. But I I am fully convinced that the reason why it t- took this long is because I myself was struggling with, uh, I was struggling with temptation in my life. I was struggling with, with, with just trials. And, and in order for me to better preach it to you, I had to endure this and, 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 and see that what I was telling you was the truth. I went through a period in my life where uh, I, I, I was struggling. It was very clear to me that I had allowed sin to come into my life. And can I tell you, I didn't want it to be there. I didn't. I, I was disgusted by it. I was ashamed of it. I uh, I answered the right way. I smiled the right way. I walked like a Christian. I talked like a Christian. But I was struggling, and God made it very apparent in my life. But I'm grateful. I don't stand here and boast in my confidence, but I stand in in, in the power of the Word of God that I I can I can honestly say I have been able to overcome this part of temptation in my life. I no longer have to struggle with it because uh, I, I was able to see that the, the, that the Lord has given me everything. I am equipped to be victorious, not just in this part of my life, but in all parts of my life. Amen? So if you will allow me, I just want to do a brief recap because it's been so long ago since we started this series. I'm just going to do a, a brief recap and um, then we'll dive into the message. But we started off by looking at temptation itself. And if you guys remember, as we look at temptation, we realized that temptation is not a sin. Can we say amen to that? Here's why I think this is good news for us, church, because each and every one here, no matter what walk, part of your walk in, in, in the faith you are, you will struggle with temptation. You will struggle with a trial. You will struggle with something in your life. And you need to know that temptation is not a sin. That's good news, church. Can we say amen? When, when the enemy comes and he tempts us, we can say no. We have that option, praise God. But here's the bad news. 
because we have been given everything to be equipped to overcome temptation. When we give into it, it causes us a separation from God. Need, needlessly, needless, easy for you to say, needlessly, right? Because we have been equipped. However, we give over our victory. Amen? So, I have a couple of verses that I want to share with you in case there, you are struggling or you will struggle, right? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, according to the Word of God, each and every one of us will struggle with, with temptation in some way, shape, or form. But we're going to go through a trial. And these verses will help you. So I'm just going to give you three verses uh, to help you. Is that all right if I do that? You can write them down. You can mark them down in your Bible. But these are to help you in your Christian walk. The first verse that we're going to look at is 1 Corinthians 10.13. Listen to what the, the, the Apostle Paul says. It says, there has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. So what does this mean? Let's stop there for a second. What, what the Apostle Paul is saying that, that whatever temptation you're going through is not unique to you. Do you understand that? You're not the only one going through this trial. Now, the enemy will tell you that no one will understand you. What would those, those, those people from Sand Hill say when, when you confess your sins? They will look down on you. They won't understand. That's what the enemy tells you. But here the Apostle Paul is saying that you're not as unique as you think you are. We all deal with temptation in our life. Amen? We all deal with a struggle. He goes on to say, But God... Is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Can we shout amen for a second there? I'm not just trying to get a reaction from you, right? I, it's not to make me feel good that you say amen, but can we truly understand this for how precious this is to us? Meaning that whatever temptation you're going through, whether it's lust or whether it's anger or whether it's worry, whatever temptation you're going through, can I tell you, God has made a way for you to overcome it. Praise God, whatever, whether it's addiction, whatever you're going through, Christian, God has made a way for you to overcome it. Hey, man, we should shout hallelujah to that. Listen to what James says. James says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive a crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Now, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I understand all the riches of God's words uh, and that I can explain to you what this crown of life is. I, I, I did a little bit of research on it, and I, I feel like I would just confuse you if I try to explain it. But can I tell you this is good news? God is pleased with you if you are able to endure to the end. Amen? If you don't succumb to sin, God is pleased with you. That is good news. To know that God has given me everything that I need to be able to overcome sin and to know that my Savior, my Creator is pleased with me, that should make me happy. Amen? But we also have a warning. And that's where the next verse comes in, all right? Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says. He says in Hebrews 3, 8, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. We look in the second part, we took a look at sin and the dangers of sin. And now I'm not talking about sin to an unbeliever. I'm talking about allowing sin to a Christian. Whatever that sin may be, whether it's worry or whether it's anger or whether it's lust or whatever your flavor is, sin in a, a, a Christian has consequences. Here we see that Israel, when they when they had unbelief in their hearts after God did miracle after miracle after miracle in the wilderness, they hardened their hearts. Can I tell you that God can turn a hard heart into, into flesh, right, when he saves us? But there's a danger when we give in to sin because we harden our hearts again. We harden our hearts. 
When God is proving, is showing and proving himself that he is faithful, we just heard Sister Renee sing that song, tell me a time that he hasn't been faithful. When you start giving in to sin, let me tell you, your heart starts getting hardened. And we looked at the dangers of that, right? We took a look at Lot. It didn't just affect him, church. It affected his whole family. It affected his whole family. That scares me as a father. That scares me as a husband. That scares me as a member of Sand Hill. I can say that now. <laughs> but do you understand that when I allow sin in my life, Brother Charles, I am affecting you. We're part of the same body. We just talked about caring for one another, right? That was part of the, the, the creed. I should care about you. I sh when I allow sin in my life, I I'm affecting you. There's a danger in allowing sin in your life. I gave this example, right? But it's like a fire that, that grows out of control. Earlier, uh, I think it was uh, uh, in, Oct in October, I... Um, when we had that beautiful weather, I went outside, right? And the leaves had fallen, and I had some, uh, some brush that I had to burn. So I went to the fire pit, and I already had all the, all the stuff there, and I had a lot of things to do, so I just lit it on fire quick. And foolishly, I didn't realize, or I didn't pay attention, I had leaves all around the fire pit. And all of a sudden, the fire started to spread, Right? And can I tell you, I'm not here to over-dramatize things and say, ooh, my house almost burnt down. But it caused me to panic a little bit. So I started quickly sweeping the leaves around it, right? So, I, so, so that it wouldn't catch a fire. But that is how quickly a fire can get out of control. I had my two sons with me there. It could have affected them. My wife was at work. She did not know I was doing this, right? Sometimes we, we hide sin in our life, right? We're too ashamed, right? But can I tell you, that will eventually come to the light. What we try to hide will destroy your household. Yeah. Right? Do we see the dangers of sin in the life of a Christian? Yeah. Can I tell you, sin doesn't always look unattractive. Sometimes sin looks attractive. I give this example all the time, right? But if I just give that coworker a piece of my mind, oh my goodness, that'll make me feel so good. Right? Or what if I just tell this person who cut me off in traffic how I feel? Or how about if I just worry a little bit about this problem? There's danger in that church. I hope we understand that. But now let's take a look at today's message. So I'm, I, I will confess that as I was preparing for this message, I did something that at the time it just felt wrong. It wasn't wrong, but it just felt wrong. I started studying and learning more about Satan. And, and as I was studying and learning about him, it just felt, it felt wrong. I don't know what it was. It was just this weird feeling like I shouldn't be doing that. Can I tell you that's a trick from the enemy? That's a trick from Satan, right? As we study God's word right now, I'm not going into extracurricular writings and stuff or, or secular writings. I'm going into God's word as I'm searching, right? And here's the things that the enemy will do. Um, as Christians, we either don't, make, don't think about him, we ignore him completely, or we make him too big. And we make them equal to God. And both of those things are false. We should know about the enemy and the wiles and the tricks of the enemy. And that's what I did. So in, in the account of the story in the book of Matthew, he, they call him, the, uh, the writer calls him the tempter. Right? That's what he does. He deceives. He, he, he tries to confuse. He tries to lure you away from, from following God. That's what he does, church. Now, as Christians, you should know that you have three enemies. Did you know that? Did you know that there's three enemies to the Christian, to the believer? First is the flesh, right? The flesh just seeks pleasure. Anything that makes me feel good, we want that constant pleasure, that, that here and now, whatever that is, whether it's gluttony, whether it's fornication, whether it's uh, whatever it is, entertainment, we seek that constant pleasure. Pleasure all the time is a bad thing. That should raise a red flag. If it's constant pleasure, it's a, it's a bad thing. The flesh gains nothing from living a spiritual life. The next enemy is the world. What do I mean by that? Do I mean that the mountains and the trees are trying to attack you? No, right? But the world as a whole has beliefs that don't line up with God's word. 
The Bible says that they will hate you because they hated me, right? That we understand that the things that are in God's word, the world doesn't like as a whole. Listen, they do things, right, that, 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 that sound good. We accept everyone. We love everyone. But they're just confusing. Now, your third enemy is who we're going to be studying today is, is, is Satan. And we're not going to be studying him so much as, as far as his, uh, the temptations. We're going to be looking at the temptations. So Satan will use the flesh and will use the world to deceive you. To tempt you, to lure you away from following God's word and being obedient to God's word. That's what Satan does. He uses that. However, we should know that the Bible describes him as a fallen foe. He's a defeated foe. The only way that he has victory is if we give it over to him. See, there's a passage in the Bible that says it's in Revelation that says that he's the accuser of the brethren. And I read this thing that really made sense, right? So what he does is he goes and he, he it, it painted the scene of, a, uh, of a, a court, a trial, and he'll go before God and he'll, he'll say uh, he'll accuse you. But because you're a believer and you're covered under the blood of Christ, it doesn't work. So what does he do? He appeals to a lower court and he comes to you and he tells you, how bad you are. He tells you how you don't deserve God's uh, mercies. He tells you how bad you have screwed up. Now, naturally, what we do is uh, we either do one, uh, we'll do one of a couple of things, right? We'll either boast in ourselves and say, well, I'm not that bad. Look at so-and-so. They're worse than me, right? And then we deserve pride in our life. Or we fall to his tricks and we say, well, there's no possible way God could use me. But what we should do is say, yes, I am a screw up. But praise God, I'm covered under the blood of Christ. Amen. He's paid the price. And see, God uses the, we've said it over and over, God uses the, the, the flawed. That's good news. Today we're going to look at the temptations. We're going we're gonna to take a look at these now. One of the things that, that we see here is that he was tempted, uh, Jesus was tempted for 40 days. The only three recordings that we have are these, are these recordings, but there was a constant temptation. There was a constant trial. It was over and over and over. It was pressure, constant pressure. Can I tell you, when Saint comes and, uh, and tempts you and attacks you, it's not going to be at the best time. It's not going to be at the most convenient time. It's not going to be when you have the good hair day. It's going to be when you're running late. It's going to be when your kids are acting up and they're sick. It's going to be at the worst time and it's going to be constant. So therefore, as Christians, we should be what? Prepared. Prepared. Amen. One of the ways that we can be prepared is understand the way that he, um, that he tricks us and tries to deceive us. So I'm going to be answering a couple of questions here that um, were helpful to my studying of this story. And maybe they can be helpful to you, but uh, if you would just allow me also just to, to kind of answer these questions. Um, as, as we read this, uh, this account of the temptation, uh, and this was just burning uh, heavy on my heart, Pastor. I, I, I was wondering, did Satan know who he was up against? As he was tempting Jesus, did he know he was tempting God? Now, the Bible tells us that God cannot be tempted, Right. But did, did, did he know what we know of the Trinity? Did he know about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit like we do? He did. Now, it's amazing. If you go all the way to Genesis and you kind of study this out, we see that uh, we know that the gospel is preached even in the Old Testament, right? We understand that, right? In the book of Genesis, when, uh, when God was talking to the serpent and Eve, and, and that, we, we know that the gospel was preached there, right? So... Satan knew that from the line of this woman, there was going to be a man that was going to come and was going to deliver mankind from sin. So it's, it's, it's amazing as you, as you start seeing the way that the enemy started to, uh, to try to co corrupt the lineage from this woman. We see this in the book of, uh, in, in the book of Genesis, in the story of Noah, how uh, uh, we, um, we see that uh, it says the sons of God, the Nephilim, whatever you want to call it. I don't have time to go into it, right? But they were trying to corrupt this lineage, this seed. And then what did God do? God got more specific. He said that the, 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 the deliverer, the Messiah, was going to come from this special line uh, from Abraham. And what did he do? He tried to get uh, uh, Sarah to, to lie in bed with another person. 
over and over and over, you see the tricks that the enemy was trying to do. He was trying to corrupt his lineage. If you study this out, it's just amazing. And every time God had an answer for that. And then what did God do? He got even more specific. He said, not just Abraham, but he's going to be from the line of Judah. So God gets even more specific. and He continues there, right? If you guys remember when we were studying the, um, the uh, uh, lineage of Jesus in the previous chapter, we saw how uh, God had, had punished this, this certain king and he still made a way. Do you guys remember that? I know it's been a couple of months ago, right? But, 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 but God made a way. And over and over, and we see the enemy trying to do that, even into the New Testament. We see that when the, 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 this king was finally born, the king of kings, we see that he sent Herod, he sent out soldiers to kill all the newborn babies. Do you guys remember that? Over and over, we see Satan trying to extinguish this lineage and only to fail over and over and over again. You have all these years and you keep failing. That must be a really bad job. And we see this over and over and over again, even as we get into the, in, into, uh, the ministry of Jesus. We see that not only now he, the Messiah is here, and he no longer is trying to extinguish his line, right? He's already here. So what does he do? He tries to do everything to prevent Jesus from going to the cross. What we see here is that earlier, later in the chapter, we see that he tried to get him to push him off this, this, this cliff. But that didn't work. So what did he do? He, he, he deceived these people and to try to make Jesus into a king and not go to the cross. Over and over and over, he attempted to stop Jesus from going to the cross to pay the price that we couldn't pay, only to fail time and time again. So to answer the question, did Satan know that he was dealing with, with God? Yes, he knew that. So then it just raises the next question. The audacity of this enemy, the wickedness of this enemy, that he would do that, that he would tempt God. How could he tempt God if the Bible tells us that God cannot be tempted? Well, this doesn't speak about Satan as much as it speaks about our creator. You see, because now we see that the creator of the universe, the one that put all the hung, all the stars and the moons and the planets would step into his creation and put on flesh the weakness that you and I have only to overcome it. Church, that is good news. Yeah. That is good news to see that, that he would humble himself to our stature. Praise God that he would do that for me. After I have turned my back to God so many times, he still did it for me because he loved me. Yeah. Church, that is good news. What a beautiful picture we see here. So, he comes, and the first temptation that he, 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 he tempts Jesus is, put my, my spectacles on here. He goes and he says, the devil said unto him, if thou be the son of God, command this stone that it be made to bread. So I, I, I kind of already made mention of this, right? And I don't have time to go into the Greek uh, here. But it's not so much that he was questioning the identity of Jesus. It, 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 as a matter of fact, in some other translations, it says, since you are the son of God, he was trying to get him to prove his, his deity. And I have a simple question, church. It's kind of an obvious question. But just to, to kind of drive this point home, could Jesus turn those stones into bread? Yeah. What makes you say that? He's God. He can do it all. If we read further, we see that he, he, he does these things like that, right? He turns water into wine. He multiplies bread. So, Yes. It's kind of an obvious question, but that's, that's important for us to know that he could do this. So why didn't he? And I want us to so understand that Satan wasn't worried about Jesus' hunger pains. He wasn't worried about Jesus having a sandwich. Jesus could have turned that whole desert into a bakery if he wanted to. What he was trying to do was trying to get him to depend on himself rather than to rely on God. He was trying to deceive him. You see, nobody was around there. Who would have known? As a matter of fact, how did we even get these stories if, if, if no one was around but Satan and Jesus? How did we get these stories? 
Well, Jesus told his disciples, right? And, and, and that's how we got them, right? It was, there's a reason why these three particular stories were recorded. Years later, in 2022, can I tell you the enemy's still the same? His tricks are still the same. You see, because you have been made given promises as a Christian. Did you know that? You have been promised that he will never leave you nor forsake you. You have been promised that he will take care of you. He will provide for your every need. And yet when you're going through certain trials, the enemy will tell you to take matters into your own hands. Listen, don't trust and depend on him. Whether it's health or whether it's a job situation, right? I was just talking to a brother earlier. Listen, as families and people who have families, right, we have real concerns. How will I feed my family? How will I take care of them, right? If I lose my job, how will I provide? If I get sick, how will I provide for my family? Those are real concerns. Can we agree to that? Those are real concerns. But what the enemy will tell you is that God cannot take care of this, of, of this time, can he? Can I tell you that's a lie from, from the enemy? God will take care of it. Can you truly live it, leave it to him and he will take care of it. But the enemy will deceive you. He will paint the worst possible scenario. He will use the world and he will use your flesh to cause you to fall, to cause you to sin, to depend on yourself. The trick is still the same. But listen to what Jesus said, right? We, we know uh, if you've heard the message from here before that he quoted Deuteronomy. He says, it is written, verse 4, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. There's a, 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 a picture, a story that's given to us of Israel in the wilderness and, and they were complaining and God provided manna for them and quail. Do you guys remember that? He provided it to fall. And he gave them very specific instructions, right? He told them to only collect what you needed for the day. And then on the sixth day, collect enough for two days because on the seventh day we rest. That's the instruction that he told them, right? And Israel was obedient and they did everything to, to the T. Right? No, right? What did they do? Not all of them. Some of them collected more than what they needed. Right? Because there's, I can't trust that God will give me some tomorrow, so I'm going to collect the double portion today. Right? That's what I'm going to do. Because I have, I have a little one. I have Jonah and I have Javi, and they eat a lot. So I'm going to collect enough for today and tomorrow. And what happened to that food? It's spoiled, right? It was bad. The enemy tricked them into not believing God's word. Listen, take matters into your own hands. You provide for your family yourself. Don't depend on what God's instruction was giving you. You take care of that yourself. Only to be proven wrong. On the sixth day, God told them, collect double the portion. Now, some of them got lazy and said, obviously God is going to provide. I'm just going to wait for it tomorrow. And what happened? They went hungry. Because God did not allow it to, right? God gave them specific instructions. Now, each and every one of us here have been given specific instructions. Not specific, but we have been given instructions by God, right? Do not forsake in the gathering. Trust in him. Trust in his every word. And what do we do? We take matters into our own hands. Only to fall flat on our faces. Every time. Amen. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The enemy will tell you to take care of your tangible needs. And God is saying, trust in my word. I will do more than to trust in your tangible needs. I will trust in those. I, I, I will uh, take care of those things and I will take care of your spiritual needs also. Can I tell you, 
The enemy's not worried about your tangible needs, about your, your needs. I hope there was no one here, but do you guys remember when the pandemic first started, all the toilet paper that was being taken away from the stores? Don't raise your hand, but answer yourself, did I buy more than what I needed because God can provide everything but except toilet paper. I heard someone say I still have some left. <laughs> now you got to take enough space in your house. And church, that's relying on ourselves. That's not good. Amen? Amen. We continue. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed unto him the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I will give it to. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. So one of the things that neither of the writers did is go into detail whether this was an actual account of what happened or if this was a vision. They didn't go into detail. And the truth is that's neither here nor there but here's what we do need to know right we understand from reading Luke from the beginning that the, 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 the position of the Messiah was going to be more than a spiritual position it was going to be a political position right we, we, we covered that the king of kings he was going to sit on the throne he was going to rule the world those were those are, that's an actual thing that's going to happen we, we understand that right that is a political position that has yet to be fulfilled but that is a thing that is actually going to happen so what we see here, the enemy doing is providing a shortcut. Do we see that? He's saying that if you would trust in me, I will give you all these things that were promised to you. Take this shortcut. This, whether it was a vision or whether it was uh, 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 an actual event, whatever, however it, it, it went down, was the promise that God had given Jesus that he was going to rule over everything. We know that, right? Now, the core of this issue is not whether Satan has the power to give those things. You see, Jesus didn't debate that. He didn't get into a debate into whether that was true or not. The problem was the worship. You see, because what Satan wants is worship. Now, how, what, how does that concern us or where are we? Uh, what does that have to do with us? Well, you see, the Bible tells us that we should only worship God, right? Listen to what Jesus said. Listen to what Jesus said in, in the next verse. He says, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written that thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. He took it a step further. He's not just talking about worship. He's talking about serving, right? The thing that Satan is tempting us with is to worship him. Now, that word serve in the Greek dictionary, I don't have the, the Greek word to give you, but that word also means worship. So if you were written, right, reading this, uh, it's sometimes used for worship. So it would say, uh, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written that thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou worship. So why did they say serve instead of worship? Well, you see, these are two different types of, uh, two different types of worship. The first one is a bowing. The way that you would worship a God, it, it shows the, 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 uh, the, the, the uh, picture of someone bowing before a God. The next one is serving, is, is, is saying, uh, 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 similar to bringing your offerings uh, to the altar. And, and the picture that he's trying to uh, paint to us here, the, the thing that Jesus is trying to show us is that the things that we worship, we will eventually serve. Do we understand that? The things that we worship will eventually turn to us serving those things, whether it's God or whether it's the things of this world. Now, you say, I, well, I'm not worshiping Satan, 
But can I tell you, when, when you take matters into your own hands, right, and you take those shortcuts, whatever that is, whether it's providing for your needs, as we saw earlier, right, it begins by us considering those things more valuable than God. And then it turns into serving it. We become slaves to it. That is a dangerous place to be in as a Christian. When you start taking things into your own hands and taking shortcuts, we begin to worship those things, whether it's work, whether it's school, whether it's worrying, whatever it is, whether it's family, church, it begins with worship and it turns to serve. You see, Satan didn't, didn't take it that far, right? All he wanted was worship. He didn't want serve to be served. That's natural progression. It starts with worship. It leads to serving. That's a dangerous place to be in as a Christian. That is a very dangerous place. Lastly, we see here that the enemy, he tempts Jesus and he says he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, if thou be the son of God, there we see that again, cast thyself down from here. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands, they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone, a stone. So we see this passage in Psalm 91. And, and, and we, what we see here is that Satan uh, used this scripture, and I don't have time to get into it. If you want to know more about how Satan uses a manipulated uh, scripture, there was a, a Sunday school lesson about this, right? Um, uh, given to us about, uh, it's called Through the Ice of the Enemy, right? It's, it's, it's a wonderful lesson, but we see how he manipulates scripture. And he knows scripture, but he manipulates it. Jesus did not question or get into a debate of how he was misusing. He just answered simply. simply. He tells them that we do not test our God. And see, that is the, 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 the sometimes when we're going through a long trial, we get into the point where we want to question God. And I've said it before, we're allowed to ask God questions, but we're not allowed to question God. Listen, he can tempt us and, and put us through a test and a trial, but we're not supposed to do that. Who are we that we would have the audacity to do that to our Lord, that we would put him to a test as if, as if he has an answer to give us? Lord, if you love me, you will take care of my family, this divorce that I'm going through, my kids are going through. Who are we that we should say that, put ultimatums to our Lord? And yet, that is what the enemy does, right? He tries to deceive us, and he uses scripture, and he uses it very well, if I must say. He uses it so well, as a matter of fact, that if you're not in God's word, you will fall for it. If you're not in God's word, you will feel, fall victim to it. It amazes me that, that from this same passage from, of scripture, when the pandemic happened, and I hate I referencing the pandemic, but I saw posts all in my timeline, right, where they were talking about pestilence. They were talking about uh, uh, plagues, and they were posting these saying that God will take care of, of any pestilence. And, and Christians were boasting that God was going to take care of those needs, so they were using that as an excuse to not take care of themselves. But that is the same passage of Scripture that Satan used to test Jesus. And here we are being deceived because it sounds good because we saw somebody else posting and we're reposting it. And we're doing the same thing. We're testing the Lord our God. That is a dangerous place to be in also as a Christian. To fall for that deceit. To fall for those tricks. And I'll say this word again, needlessly. Where we don't have to. 
Now, Jesus went through this trial, right, uh, uh, of temptation. And as I mentioned, it's, 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 it's going to seem overbearing. It's going to seem like there's no way out, but we've already read the promises, right, that Jesus has, uh, God has made a way out out of any temptation. And listen to this part here. This is the, uh, the part I was going to make reference to as I was reading it earlier, right? Verse 13, it says, And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Can I tell you that he does not have absolute power? Can I tell you that he is not uh, the uh, opposite of God? He cannot be everywhere at all times. Whatever trial or temptation you're going through, it's going to last only a small period of time. Or it's going to last a period of time. It's going to have a beginning, it's going to have an end, and it's going to go in cycles, right? But God is allowing him to test you, to go through those things. Jesus even says that, uh, um, that these things have to happen, but won't to him to who they happen by. Listen, he's going to get, he's going to get his uh, just use. God is going to take care of him. So rather than to, to feel defeated, can I tell you, we have victory. We have victory over these things, church. Now, I can't possibly know what each and every one of you are going through. But can I tell you, each and every one of us will go through it if we're not already going through it now. And it's important that we know and be reminded. I'm sure that these things are not new to you. Some of you have been faithfully coming to church and been studying and reading your word. So I'm not giving you anything new. I'm just here being a faithful reminder to remind you of God's promises. And I praise God for that. Because can I tell you these things I knew also and yet I, I kept falling. I kept being defeated. I felt that as soon as temptation would come into my life that I was already a defeated Christian and it didn't have to be that way whatever that is that you're going through in your life you don't have to be defeated I thank God for for uh, God his word church I thank God for his faithfulness to remind us when we go through these things and just uh, just how good he is amen? amen if you will stand please brother Dan can you play It's Sunday, church. We had a wonderful time spending time with God's people, being in God's word in both services, worshiping him in spirit and truth. But Monday is coming. Monday is coming and the enemy is coming to attack you. I can't make you many promises of, uh, of wealth and health, but I can promise you that whatever the enemy does, it's only temporary. God is with you and he will not leave you nor forsake you. Church, I don't know what burdens you're going through. If you need to come up to the altar, today's a good day to come and leave it before the Lord before your week starts. We have people here that would love to pray for you, with you. If there's anyone here that doesn't know and trust in Jesus, if you were to lay your head down tonight and you don't know if, if you're going to spend an eternity with him, why not take care of it today? whether it's online or whether it's here, why not take care of it today? He says that these things have I written to you so that you will know. Not because of how good or bad you are, but because of how good he is. Amen? All heads bowed. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you, Lord, knowing we have nothing to offer you, Lord, but our mistakes, our sins. And yet, Father, your word promises that you will forgive us. Father, your word promises that your mercies are new every day. Father, whatever my brothers and sisters are going through, Lord, I pray that you would give them the strength to endure. Father, you promise us that when we endure to the end, Lord, you will be pleased with us, Father. And you have equipped us to endure to the end. So I ask you to forgive us when we give over that victory. I ask, Lord, that you would not Stop reminding us of your faithfulness. That you would not stop reminding us, Lord, of how you equipped us and how we can be victorious. And that this victory does not look like what the world would consider victory, but sometimes victory looks just like what Job went through. 
We thank you, Father, just for how great you are. We ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.